Hey, this is Lene Valentine uh, with Layman's Bookstore. Uh, please like us on Facebook, uh, join us on YouTube, and the new videos we're always putting out. Um, today we're going to do an interview with Mike Daly, uh, who wrote The Promised Land, another audiobook for adults, also for children, very family friendly. Uh, if you're interested in westerns and that sort of thing, please check it out. We'll have it up in the store and on YouTube, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Mike Daly. Mike, so. What inspired you to create this story, The Promised Land? What was the inspiration? Where did it come from? Well, the original idea started when um, there was a certain person that I knew that went off to prison, and I felt compelled to write him a letter to try to explain to him in this letter of the proper way to treat your fellow man. And it actually turned into a story and the character name that I have in there, the main character's name is Josh, which just so happens to be the same name as the person that was in prison, and I thought it would strike a chord with him. Mm. So as I, as I wrote the story, and I wrote the first chapter out, and I completed the first chapter, which was just a letter to him, mm. and then somehow I, I followed the rabbit hole and felt compelled to continue the story and and went from there. So what did this Josh do, this real life character that inspired you to write the book? What exactly did he do and why why did you write this story specifically for him? Well, actually it appeared to me that he wasn't really living up to the way that God wants him to live. Well, apparently if he's behind bars, he must have done something wrong. And he seems seemed to um, keep breaking the law and not doing what he's supposed to do, treating people not in the way that you're supposed to treat them to, in an everyday way. And that's exactly what put him back in prison. Mm -hmm. um, he was he does have some uh, problems with um, certain drugs, and I'm sure that that attributed to a lot of his problem. Mm -hmm. But still, I care about him. So yeah. I wrote him this book hoping that he would read that and say, I wish I was more like the character that he's writing about, how this, how this man stood up to all the other people in the town and said, don't treat people like that. Here's how you're supposed to treat them. Yeah. And hopefully that maybe would open his eyes and have him change. Well, whether he changes or not is completely on him, though. Mm. And I just followed the rabbit hole from there. Yeah, so... Uh... You wrote about Josh, and it's it was very surprising to me that the character was, he was actually, he seemed to run and provide for a lot of the characters. He used to, he used to provide, or I mean, in the story, he provided, uh, he owned the stables, right? He was a well-to-do, and yet he never let on. He never let on that he had money, and he ended up helping the main character, uh, that was also very interesting. Well, he even mentions it a few times in the book that when you start getting too proud with what you have and start bragging about it, he even mentioned a few times that that he that his father told him, be thankful with what you have and share it with everybody because if you do that, then God won't take it away and let you keep what you have. Mm. I believe there's even a few of those 12-step programs out there that says we keep what we have by giving it away. Yeah. And maybe that's where I might have gotten that concept from. So did you, you were inspired by this Josh character, real life Josh character. Were you also inspired uh, by something like dreams or uh, some sort of revelation or things that happened in your own life, your own personal life that helped you develop the story? Well, after I wrote the first chapter, and I had it all complete. Um, the next day when I woke up, I'm like, ooh, 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 I got an idea. I'm going to continue on there <laughs> and show how this person that was rescued by Josh can actually help this town mm. and maybe possibly an angel in disguise. Because it seems that everything that this person did that showed up at the town that everybody wanted to leave the town, which is actually in the first couple chap uh, the first couple paragraphs talks about how they just wanted the, this guy to get out of their town. Mm. Um, seems that 
by Josh rescuing him and keeping him in the town, everybody's lives started changing. Mm. So are you trying, in this story, were you trying to tell something to society or a certain group of friends, anything um, with this development of this town, how they treated, because they treated the character, this Luke, old Luke character that came wandering into town. He was, uh, he had been ambushed on the road by some bad men, but they ended up treating him badly too. But after that, Josh stood up, right? Josh stood up and protected him. And the character started to change. Like, are you trying to say something to society today or something? How are you inspired? Like, what made you develop these characters? Um, well, as you saw in the first chapter, as each person that Josh went up to, um, Josh said, what did this guy do to you? And apparently this old man did nothing to them. And they said, well, he doesn't have anything for us. So Josh called each of those people out because they all owed him something because he helped every one of them in their lives. Hmm. And he called each one of them out saying, you owe me a favor. Now we're going to call it even. All you have to do is walk away and leave this man alone. And it made all the town folks seem really ashamed as he called each one of them out for their, for their own personal iniquities. Yeah. And by the time he helped Luke, oh Luke, um, he took care of Luke for day for a few days. And when Luke came around and started talking and telling his story of what happened with him, I guess Josh like really opened up to this old man saying, This guy has so much to say. Even in the Bible it says, Remember, you got to entertain strangers. Because some folks, by entertaining strangers, have entertained angels unaware. Mm. Was, was this man sent by God? I th think that that's what I try to portray. And nobody recognized it except Josh, that this man, don't hurt this man. And then it was revealed to Josh that this man is probably the best, is the best thing that ever happened in this town. This, this man that looked like he had nothing mm. was the best thing that happened. I... Him. Yes. So I do know that the first two chapters, I was wondering myself, was this old Luke, this stranger that wandered into town, was he actually an angel? Is this, was it something symbolic that you were well, trying to portray, or was he just a typical man? Well, that, you know, a friend of mine read the book, and uh, he was, uh, I knew him since high school, <laughs> and he actually said to me uh, at the end of the book, as he was getting to the end of it, and he was helping me edit it a little bit. Um, he said that he expected this character to sprout wings and fly away at the end. Yeah, he just seemed too perfect, it almost seemed. He always had, he always said the right thing at the right time. And even my husband, Theodore, uh, we're all good friends, so you know him very well. Um, he started crying at a certain point, at the end of the first chapter, actually. I can't remember what it was. It was maybe a prayer. Uh, but he started crying because of the words that old Luke said. It hit something about this book hits your heart. Yeah. Oh, yeah. thanks. It was when uh, Luke, when he knelt down after he, uh, when Josh approached old Luke in the street, when people were throwing garbage at him, he approached uh, old Luke and said, "I'll take care of you." Mm -hmm. You know, and then, uh, well, they can't see me. I'm over here transitioning the video, but um, when you know the townspeople are throwing garbage at old Luke. Just treating him awfully, and uh, Josh walks over to him after he settles the score with everybody. You know, saying, "Hey, listen, leave this man alone. Go do, you know, go do me a favor." Uh, he comes down and he he bends down and tells old Luke, "Don't worry, I'll take care of you." And that was the epitome of what Christianity should be doing. We should be taking care of each other, and that struck a chord with me. And um, anyway, it made me cry. So I'm, thank you for. I'm sharing. glad to hear that. Because when, when he did <laughs> kneel down and said, don't worry, I got your back. Mm. Um, I'm here through thick and thin. I, I already fended off the enemy. And now I'm here to, to scoop you off the street and take you back to where I live and bring you into my home and, and help you heal with what, with what you went through. And yeah. didn't even know the man's story or where he came from or anything. Yeah. But that stuff became... 
That stuff was revealed as you read, as you read through the first chapter, that's revealed as old Luke tells his story about how he was ambushed mm -hmm. and how he had, how he was a miner, he was a prospector, and how he was ambushed by three guys and they just left him for dead. Mm -hmm. And somehow he wasn't and he saw the town and wandered for days, a couple days, seeing the town off in the distance from the mountain. And by the time he got there, he was not in very good shape because he's an older man mm. and he wasn't and, and he really went through the ringer and by the time he got there he just kind of collapsed in the street in a daze yeah. barely making it there and if Josh if, if he would have been left there in the street he would have died yeah what was almost scary to me was how the townspeople reacted it was it was like can we actually get he was already beat up they could see that and yet they would yell they yelled dirty words at him it was like, can humanity actually get that low? Well, today, in today's society, mm. when, you, when, when you have strangers coming into certain cities, um, I'll tell you what, a really good example was um, in the one movie, uh, First Blood, Sylvester Stallone wanders into a town and the sheriff tells him, get out of our town and, and gives him a ride. And all he wanted to do was walk in there and get something to eat. Mm. And the sheriff um, said, no, you're not allowed to stay here and drove him out of town and dropped him up and just wanted to get rid of him. You're not allowed here. Well, the town folks, since they didn't really have a law enforcement, they just had them living in this western town, they were basically treating him the same way that the sheriff treated um, um, uh, what was his name uh, from Walking Talk, uh, from uh, Rambo, First Blood. Uh, they they kind of treated um, old Luke like that. Yeah. Get out of our town. We don't want you here. We don't put up with your kind here at all. And Josh had this Christian upbringing from his father. Everybody in the town were actually Christians, but they were also afraid hmm. of somebody coming into their town because they had families to protect and stuff like that. And sometimes, even in the name of God or in the name of Jesus, you have to accept certain people, strangers, that come into your town. Mm -hmm. When I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. That's things that, that God calls you to do, that Jesus called people out that helped take care of our fellow man. Yeah. Well, I find that a lot today, that that's that we falter in that area. Mm -hmm. how, how willing are we to like open our house to someone that doesn't have the same name as us? Yeah, so Josh kind of acted like the Good Samaritan, right? But we find out that he actually had his own problems. He had trouble later on in a couple of chapters later, I think chapter four you mentioned, uh, Rowdy Roxy. Roxy is this woman that he loves um, but he doesn't know how to tell her that he loves her. Well, I guess Luke helped him over that hurdle a little bit because he told Josh, you're holding back and um, you need something in your life. Everybody else in this town has wives and children and um, Josh is missing out in his life because he's so busy helping, um, taking care of the town that maybe he was, he's afraid. He's He's afraid. Maybe um, he isn't. He was in love, and Luke finally called him out and says, "Tell this woman how you feel about her, please. Mm -hmm. Even the whole town knows that you care about this woman." And yeah. well, the story goes from there, as you know. So what was interesting to me, I know I talked a little bit before the interview that we started just now, was we talked about this relationship that you put in the book. Uh, so was it a mixture? of this Josh, real life Josh character that you modeled, that you started with the book on him and it developed into something that was in your own life relationship wise? Or was it this Josh character, were you still trying to speak to him or what were you trying to portray? Well, I'm not really sure if I, after I sent him this first chapter in prison and he was mentioning, cause he, he got the letter just a couple days later and somehow got a hold of me and said that I'm ready for the next chapter mm. um, you're gonna write some more where does the story go from there and I was already working on um, chapter two and chapter three and, and going on with it and so I was trying to like get the other chapters done 
just I just had to start following the rabbit hole and putting it all together because when I first wrote that chapter or first wrote that letter there was no character names mm. so as I went through the book I had to go back to the first chapter and give everybody names in the books because they were all the different people in the town and as you go through the book you find that each person in the book each character each of their lives were affected by this man that they were getting ready to throw out of town. Yeah, talking about the names, I noticed that a lot of them were biblical names. Uh, did you do that on purpose because of certain characters in the Bible with those names in, well, associated with those? Actually, it was easier <laughs> to find the names because they were written right there in front yeah. of me. <laughs> I mean, you look at uh, at the rich man, uh, Thaddeus Bartholomew Davison. Well, two of the apostles are Thaddeus and Bartholomew. It just seemed to fit right together, Thaddeus Bartholomew Davidson. So, so, so it just sounded like a rich guy, even though I used apostle yeah. names. <laughs> James and John were... Because he had a longer name. <laughs> as you go through that, you have the, you have these twins named Leah and Rachel, and that's uh, actually the two wives of, uh, of, of Jacob. Um, did I have that right? Um, Israel, Jacob. Um, um, yeah, but... You have Joseph in the Bible, and there's a man named Joe. And Joseph in the Bible was married to, um, was given Azeneth by the Pharaoh. Mm. And so I used the name Azzi, mm. which just fit right in. Um, Isaac the farmer, well, Isaac in the Bible, his wife's name was Rebecca, so I mm. made his wife's name Becky. And it just made it not only easier for me to remember because I had a reference, but also it, it just seemed to fit, especially back then. In the 1890s and in the 1900s, they used a lot of biblical names, naming their children in that era of time. Come on, we watched Little House on the Prairie, mm -hmm. and, uh, and 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 a lot of the names were basically Bible names. Mm, yep, um, my personal family, I have people that have Bible names as well. I understand that a lot of Christians' families actually mm -hmm. do continue with that same concept. So. <clears throat> Bartholomew, this rich guy, Thaddeus. Thaddeus Bartholomew Davidson. This character, he was, he was like a mean character in this book. He was rich. He had his own issues. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about his character and well, how... Well, he was uh, kind of like born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He mm -hmm. inherited everything he has from his father, from his grandfather, who settled on that land years before and and they were there when the main town built the railroad and they were all plugged into it and made a lot of money with the town growing and he just became rich and lived in the biggest mansion in town along with uh, well I won't spill all the beans of all the different characters um, but because of his meanness he was kind of spanked a little bit hmm. yeah i know his mom wanted to spank him and uh told him that she couldn't because he was kind of he was too big and old to be spanked even though he deserved it hmm. and he was he was just born like that and somehow when he was spanked bad enough by god in different areas where his life was finally falling apart at the end he had a change of heart hmm. and turned his life back to god yeah, so his mother at one point, I remember, threw a Bible at him because he was just being nasty to some of the other characters. Well, were you trying to tell somebody or, you know, in society, you know, were you trying, was there another message there about spoiling your children or... Well... And the effect it might have. Or, well, I can't really speak terribly for everybody that has money or anything like that, but I know if you're a kid that is the richest kid in town. Mm. And sometimes you get like this air about you that I'm better than everybody else. Mm. And I guess old Luke really called him out on that and really chewed him out and really ticked him off pretty bad where he was just yelling and screaming and so mad. And, and they just left him mad like that. And he marched out of there and even did different little mad things that are brought up later in the book. And so finally, in, uh, in chapter 8, uh, the, that last chapter in, the, in my first part, um, 
he has the change of heart and he's out there in the street and he's begging the town for forgiveness mm. for the way that he treated them because his whole life was falling apart by them. Yeah, so what led him to want redemption? What what was the triggering point? Did not didn't somebody else in his life, you know, tell him to shape it up or do you think that never well, happened? Well, the true thing that really changed him was that he finally realized that the woman that he's married to that he loves mm-hmm. and his daughters said straight out that they would rather be mm-hmm. poor and happy than rich and miserable mm-hmm. and were willing to just leave him and his money and go off and make a new life for themselves. And that's the part that devastated him. Because he did care about his family. He did love his wife. But he lost touch with that reality. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, what about... I know that Josh... This relationship between Josh and old Luke. Mm -hmm. It seemed like... At first I thought, going back to the whole angel thing, I thought that old Luke was going to turn out to be some sort of angel, but Josh actually ended up doing reciprocating. It was like this give and take sort of thing that they were helping each other to develop into better people. Well, the same way as any kind of spirituality goes with God, we are not, well, how is it it written somewhere in some books? We are not an island amongst ourselves. We are not on an island. We have to deal with other people all the time because we are not out there all by ourselves. We could put ourselves in that predicament, lock ourselves in our apartment building and never talk to anybody and and turn off the cell phone and tell everybody to leave us alone. However, no matter what we do, we have to interact with people, whether it's at the grocery store, whether it's at the, uh, whether it's at church, whether you're going out clubbing, no matter where you go in your life, you're gonna have to interact with other people And what we do is we feed off each other. We feed off our spirituality to others. If we choose to hang out with crowds that are kind of shady, Mm. well, we're going to be shady too because we're feeding off what they're giving us and we're giving the same thing out. Mm -hmm. If If we're feeding off other people or sharing stuff with other people and we're doing it in a Christian way, well, they're going to boost our Christianity and we're going to boost theirs right back. So what happened is uh, as we're going through the book, you can see that all the different people in town are all starting to to more or less feed off each other's Christianity, which I believe they were losing touch with when this man came into town. So he was actually a godsend to start building that back up again. And all of a sudden, you have everybody bowing their heads and not having a problem praying together and living together and growing together and having their kids grow a certain way. And Josh started really opening up to the spirituality that Luke was giving it. And as Luke was praying, there was things that were happening that you just think, how the heck did that happen? How the, How did they go out there and and get some food, go hunting for food, and be done in no time at all. And on their way back with with more than they even expected to get. Now, that was gifts from God because they were living in the way that the Christian should live. Because as you live as a Christian, you find that God meets your needs mm-hmm. and met the whole town's needs. Yeah, you. I remember in the book that it almost seemed like, were you, this is a question for you, were you trying to demonstrate that? through the extra eggs that were uh, produced by the chickens or um, when Josh and old Luke went out and they were setting traps and they got extra animals, you know, in the traps they got. And uh, is that what you were trying to demonstrate? Yes. It, it seems that sometimes we're, oh, we're concerned with, oh my gosh, my electricity is going to be turned off next week yeah. or this is going to happen next month or that and this. And you know, when Jesus was talking to the people, the masses, and they were saying, what should, how are we going to live tomorrow? And Jesus taught them, at that point, the Lord's Prayer. And right there, if anybody knows the Lord's Prayer, I think most of the, 
most of our United States of America has heard that prayer. Mm. I mean, come on, they even, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you go to an AA meeting and everybody stands up afterwards and they recite the Lord's Prayer at mm. an Al-Anon meeting, at any kind of 12-step groups. Now, I'm not advocating or putting saying anything against 12-step groups. I think anything that introduces anybody to God and Christianity is good. Mm. Um, whether anybody thinks it's a cult, that's on them. You have to check it out for yourself. But um, when, he, when, they, when, they were, when they were taught the Lord's Prayer by Jesus, he says, give us this day. It doesn't say, give us tomorrow, give us next week. It says, give us this day. Now, let's live today. Don't worry about tomorrow and don't fret about yesterday because today has enough concerns for itself to deal with. Mm. Now, let's talk about this. When I read this part of the book, I was just like, what does this mean? You never have this happen for the hunters out there. Josh and Old Luke go on this little trip. Mm -hmm. And they're hunting and Old Luke's like, you know, just be quiet, wait for God. And all of a sudden you have these two bucks that are like clashing with each other. And they end up shooting at the same time and getting both bucks. Was there some sort of symbolic thing in that or... Yeah, there know. is. How are you, what inspired you to write that specific thing? Because I have never heard anything like that before. I'm not sure if that's even possible <laughs> to happen. It's just, when you, with the way it's told in the book, it sounds like it's feasible. Yeah. Okay? And for this man to just sit there with his eyes closed and saying, no, I'm waiting for God to draw me that picture of where these bucks are going to be standing. And then the next thing you know, they're both um, really quietly aiming their their guns at two bucks that are just standing there ready to fight each other hmm. that aren't really paying attention to them and they bag both of them at the same time well that well, was a blessing from god yeah because instead of getting one buck now they got two bucks now they got a whole town of people with kids and one of Josh's things that he does in the town is he goes out hunting and he brings stuff back to the town for the town folks to eat um, there's also other things in the town. I'm sure that the farmer had because they did have a pig on a spit on the in the in the in a party that they were having. So, and Isaac the farmer is constantly farming stuff and and growing fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. And they have like well, they're in a nice watered valley. Um, it was just gifts from God. Yeah. And for Josh to look at that, saying that never happened before. Mm. I never saw anything like that before. And the way that it's explained in the book, that you, that you think to yourself, that's really possible to happen. Mm. What's the odds? Well, I don't think God plays the odds. Mm. He already knows who's going to win. There is no odds on that. Yeah. So. He can do whatever he wants. Uh, so these people that robbed uh, old Luke, Rowdy Roxy comes into town, and she's like, yeah, I ran into those oh, guys. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Rowdy Roxy was a whole <laughs> character in herself. Now, you got to understand that, uh, that, you see, my daughter was really upset with me when I wrote the book. Okay? <laughs> Why was that? As I was writing the book, and she said, Dad, you used all these names in the book. You use Chris's name, you use Mikey's name, you use Jesse's name, and yep. you didn't use my name, Roxy. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, how am I going to write her? Because uh, Roxy is not even a Bible name. Right, okay? I, I was about to say. I, can't, I the... can't find the name <laughs> Roxanne in the Bible. And so I said, well, how am I going to do this? And then I thought, you know, why don't we do a, a Calamity Jane-style yeah. character? I shoot them up, but pretty... Mm -hmm. The same as Calamity Jane. I mean, we watch Calamity Jane. We uh, stuff like that. I think uh, Jane Russell played Calamity Jane in the one movie that we had here, and uh, I think there was another one with um, was what was that Doris Day or something played Calamity. Anyways, um, I have to, I maybe have to Google that sometime and find out for sure. But so I named the character Rowdy Roxy, yeah. and I was trying to think of all kinds of other names, but it seemed that it just it just kind of came out Rowdy Roxy. And she turned out to be like a shoot 'em up cowgirl, but yeah. she was nice, she was pretty, she was shapely, and but she was talented with what she did. Yeah. And she was she was a tough chick. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what she was. She was tough, but she had a heart of gold. And mm -hmm. she had a heart that was hurting too. 
and she was craving something, but she just had to prove to the world and prove to herself that she can live on her own and be complete on herself, mm. which is what she proved too. Was this a message to your daughter or uh, just totally off of your daughter, the character that you created or what? Why Calamity Jane? <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know where the whole concept came from. It was just interesting. Uh, I, I wanted, well, I think she mentioned the one time where some guy tried to like take the peek at her in the bathhouse. She ran outside and knocked the dude out cold by smacking him. Okay. Yeah. Now, <laughs> so I don't know too many women that can really do that, but she did. And still be feminine. And still enough. be feminine and still be sweet and still be kind and still be soft-spoken at the same time go to war when it's time to go to war. Yeah. That's the kind of person that she is. As a matter of fact, in part two, they even, uh, I don't even want to go tell you what happens to her in, in, my, in my second uh, part two book. So, <laughs> but there is some things that because I, I try to continue the story from what I have on the eight chapters, so there is more after that. But I try about tried, her history, maybe. Well, yeah, it does. From? It does start talking about her history, and and you even find out some surprising things where where there's a lot more people that know each other than you think. Hmm. It's a smaller go, world than it already right. is. Right, it's a small world after all. I mean, we got a small town, we have a larger town, and Rowdy Roxy seemed to um, have gotten around, even though she was a sweet, kind, very virtuous woman. But at the same time... She had that spark. Yeah, she had that fire under her behind where she just had to go out and prove mm -hmm. to the world and prove to herself that she's good, mm -hmm. that she's good at what she does. And she proved it really well, especially when she uh, really got Mr. Davidson quite upset with her a mm. few times. What happened there with Mr. Davidson? Well, I don't really want to spill too much of the beans, but apparently uh, it, <laughs> me it, it mentions... Um, because he was a hardcore, like he was a, he seemed like he was pretty mad in the beginning of the book, well, so... Well, she had history with him and actually watched his kids for him and he kind of fired her when she was showing the kids how to throw a lasso in his backyard. Yeah. And when that happened, he ran outside and started yelling at her and she called them a, a couple names and and left. Mm. And these these the kids that the two the, his his daughters who she was watching were really quite devastated from that, mm -hmm. and they followed her career as she went out there and and became a um, like a basically a rodeo star where she would be able to shoot better than the men and uh, be able to rope the cattle faster than a man could and was was going on cattle drives and doing rodeos and and she really proved herself in that area. Mm -hmm. Why did she leave, though? Why? What made her the woman that she was? You know, what developed her into this adventurous? Well, actually... Or is that too much? Is, well, I can kind of share that because it's not really written yet. Hmm. But the idea somewhere in the back of my head was that when she, when she was quite young, something happened to her parents where she was kind of on her own. Yeah. And... And that's the kind of person that she had to learn how to survive and and continue to grow up. I believe that um, I was going to make it appear like she lost her parents when she was about 14, 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And her dad already showed her how to throw a lasso. And that's where I was going to go with the story. But that's not even written yet. Okay. Yeah. But that but I was going to try to like write that in there somehow as I get through each person's history. It's not, it's not totally important to have that in the book, but it was just part of the idea. If anybody ever asks me as to where she came from, well, I have an idea yeah. of where she could have came from. So she was a good girl. She was a great girl. And what happened was she was so devastated by her being thrown out of, basically almost thrown out of t out of town because she was thrown out of this man's property, yeah. and she was actually watching his kids. She was doing a good job, and they loved her, and they got and they were quite sad, and they actually followed her by collecting her posters or actually finding out where she was doing her rodeos and and, and collected little memorabilia things that because uh, they were rich kids. And, and they had they, they were able to get get that stuff got, gotten to them 
through the railroad and so on. So she didn't leave by choice. She was forced out. Right. Okay. She was forced out. However, she came back in the town and really kind of took Mr. Davidson off, especially when it was, well, I guess I can kind of say this, um, I guess I, he uh, had a rodeo in the town and it seemed that she came in the town and was and joined up for the rodeo and just whooped all his guys. Mm. Okay. And... Whooped them with everything from shooting to roping a cattle to uh, to uh, how to train horses and dancing around with, with her horse, Stormy. Mm. So uh, going back to this, the people that jumped or I guess, I, don't, I wouldn't use the word abused. I guess they really did. They stole all the stuff from old Luke and they shot Rowdy Roxy's horse. What happens to them? Do they get justice? Um... In the future books, or well, would you rather not reveal? Well, part? they sort of got a little <laughs> justice from Rowdy Roxy when they tried to rob her, and it was the same people that jumped old Luke. So it turns out because, um, as as you see, when that she returned some property that was stolen from Luke mm. that these guys had, and she actually came in the town with her limping horse and had and had also had their firearms. And her, and her horse that got shot in the leg. Yeah, you know, what's interesting to me, what I love about this story, is that it can reach so many people. Mm. Everybody goes through problems. Every character in this book go through, well, going I through was, something. Well, I was kind of hoping that maybe if somebody reads the book, they'd be able to at least relate with one or two of the characters and how they deal with their problems, even though you have certain things in your life that you want and you have goals in your life and you just seem that they're unattainable. Mm -hmm. But you know something, there's also mm -hmm. another thing that says in the Bible that with God, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. So just because you're faltering in your life or you think um, I'm not ever gonna get out of this rut that I'm in, well, it even says with God, all things are possible. It says mm -hmm. turn to the Lord and he'll heal the nation, the whole nation. And it seems like, to me anyways, that old Luke was that character that brought that spirit, that thought back to the people. With everything he did, let's pray. With everything that they went through, he would say something about his own life. I would like personally to know about his history himself. Where did he come from? But I don't know if you're going to write about that in your future books. Well, it, but. Luke kind of explains a little bit about his father and his mother, how he uh, um, a town that he used to live in with them and he gets into sort of like little stories in that area of exactly what happened. I think right in chapter two it says that he said that his dad, he doesn't think that his dad would have up and left the town he was living in except he, his, his, dad, his dad believed that the town they were living in had the devil living there too. And then he also makes a comment towards Josh saying, but in your town it seems like there's no devil living here at all. Well, it seems to mm -hmm. me that uh, the devil was taken over that town. Mm -hmm. And these men were showing, by the way they were treating him in the street, they were showing anybody that reads the book that, that they were getting taken over by some kind of a thing. And it seems that this, when this man came into town, an angel in disguise, that's why the first chapter is called Recollection of the Heart or Recollection of the Hearts. Mm -hmm. That the, that the men in town all got together and they actually showed up right away at Josh's house, at his cabin, to help this old man mm -hmm. that was delirious. And they're like, let's clean him up, let's bandage him up, let's try to give him something to eat and try to bring him back to health. And we are so sorry for what we did to you. It mm -hmm. was completely and totally uncalled for. It was so unchristian. So they had a awakening because they were called out on what they were doing. Mm. And Josh was willing to put everything out there saying, I did this for you. Just leave this guy alone. That's all I'm asking for you to do in return. But they took it one step further and showed up and says, we're here to help. Mm. We're here to help. So we're so sorry for what we did. The change was definitely drastic. Did old Luke remember what they did to him? He was kind of in his own world, it seemed, but did he well, remember? Well, all he remembered was, well, as he stated, all he remembered was some angel scooping him up off the street. I believe the way he said it was, 
um, what do you say? It must have been an angel taking me up to the Lord God Almighty <laughs> himself. So the Lord God can give me the righteous judgment that I see is fitting, okay? And yeah. he's ready for his judgment. He thought he was dying. Mm. He thought he was on his way out. And he woke up saying, where am I? Mm. And he, and that was actually Josh that was picking him up off the street that he saw as an angel that was picking up and saving him mm. or bringing him to heaven. And then when he woke up in Josh's cabin, he's like, wow. Mm. I'm still alive. So he says all those nice things to a town that beat him up, that didn't treat him well. It's kind of amazing. But that's how Christ's love is, right? Well, yeah. Well, as you saw after that, when he woke up. Mm -hmm. well, let's, end, let's end do part two. Okay. Okay. Cause, cause it's, yeah. Um, can you tell him that? Okay. So we're going to uh, wrap this up. Um, yep. And then we're going to do a part two. We're going to do a part two just so part that we two? can split up the videos. Okay. okay, thank you and God bless you. <laughs> <laughs>